So now on to our main event. Um, Michelle Lute is, um, came to our organization recently and she is a rock star. Um, she, she started her work um, doing restoration for the National Park Service and has since um, written a dissertation on um, wildlife coexistence. So she is an expert in this field and we're very lucky to have her as part of Guardian. So thank you so much for um, joining us. Hello, thanks for coming tonight. My name is Michelle Lute, and I am not really a public speaker. I'm a hippie vegetarian, more comfortable hiking with my dogs than speaking to a room full of strangers. <laughs> I didn't join Wild Earth Guardians to give speeches. I joined Wild Earth Guardians to wage war. Specifically, to wage war against one government agency, by the name of Wildlife Services. 85 years ago, the federal government launched a war on our wildlife, and this year, we have committed ourselves to launching a major counterattack. Wildlife Services claims that its goal is to, quote, allow people and wildlife to coexist. I believe nothing could be farther from the truth. Here's some facts so you can decide for yourselves. Between 2004 and 2014, Wildlife Services spent more than one billion in taxpayer dollars to kill over 30 million animals using aerial gunning, poisons, traps, snares, and hounds. In 2014 alone, Wildlife Services spent $120 million to kill 3.9 million animals. The name Wildlife Services is completely misleading. It sounds like they do catering for animal birthday parties. <laughs> but Wildlife Services wasn't created to serve wildlife. It was created to serve ranching and agricultural interests. Recently, a study was conducted to answer the question, does the government's carnivore control programs actually protect livestock? Researchers reviewed approximately 100 studies of carnivore control programs conducted over the last 40 years. These are the same studies that Wildlife Services uses to justify its policies. The researchers found that two of these studies met the scientific burden of proof. Nonetheless, Wildlife Services continues to rely on these bogus studies to defend their bogus programs. The two studies that did meet the demands of scientific rigor found that non-lethal methods, like fences, guard dogs, were just as effective at protecting livestock. And still, Wildlife Services holds tightly to their lethal arsenal. We have to ask ourselves, why do they continue to kill millions of animals each year? Unfortunately, we can only guess at an answer because cruelty and a lack of intellectual rigor are not their only faults. Wildlife Services is also one of the least transparent agencies in government. Wildlife Services regularly declines interviews, congressional inquiries, and requests for public records. They only provide the number of animals killed per year, but never the reasons why. We can only wonder at the motivation for killing almost 5,000 cattle egrets and over 700,000 red-winged blackbirds. What is the scientific support for killing over 20,000 prairie dogs? These are not only reasonable questions, they are vital questions, and they deserve to be answered. But Wildlife Services never provides answers. They just keep hiding behind the same studies that have been proven inadequate, inaccurate, and just plain false. The reason Wildlife Services doesn't do interviews or refuses to release public records is because they know they can't defend themselves in the light of truth. Cruelty alone is a terrible thing, but cruelty that's hidden, that's sinister. 
Now I know this is all pretty grim, but it gets worse. <laughs> so I'm gonna pause for a moment so those of you who drink can ask for a little bit more liquor. <laughs> I have to get serious. Something nefarious is going on right here in Colorado. Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the state wildlife agency, has a contract with Wildlife Services that allows them to kill mountain lions and black bears with little to no oversight. Moreover, we, that's you and I, are paying almost $5 million to make that happen. Why? There are two reasons. First, the state claims there's not enough mule deer, and as their argument goes, the way you get more mule deer are by killing mountain lions and black bears. But everybody and their mother knows that deer populations are limited because of habitat destruction from the oil and gas industry. Yet Colorado Parks and Wildlife has been muzzled about talking about that by a governor who's in bed with the oil and gas big wigs. <laughs> Which brings us to the real reason this is happening. Money. The oil and gas industry has lots of money to throw at politicians who are more than happy to take it. Combine that with the fact that CBW's budget depends on selling hunting licenses. They want more mule deer because they want to sell more licenses. And it's easier to scapegoat lions and bears than to confront the oil and gas industry. These reasons perpetuate the cruel myth that the only way to kill, to manage wildlife is to kill it. But real wildlife management requires hard work and sacrifice. It means preserving wild places, which means less development in urban sprawl, which means less money for developers and the oil and gas industry. Most importantly, it requires leadership, integrity, and honesty. It means saying, we are here to represent the interest of animals and the environment. Yes. We need more owls. There are plenty of government organizations devoted to economic development. All I'm asking is, why can't the state agencies meant to represent animals actually do their job? Yeah. Right? Yeah. A good Earlier I asked, why do we continue to kill millions of animals each year? But perhaps we need to ask a slightly different question. Why do we allow this to continue? I have two ideas that could provide an answer. And if you bear, bear with me, I'm going to kind of take a roundabout way to explain them. When I was 29, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Diabetes is a major pain in the ass. I'm constantly attached to stuff. Not only do I have to go everywhere with a backpack full of supplies, I've got the sensor attached to my body that monitors my blood sugar levels. It beeps at me when my blood sugar is too low or too high or it's time to check my blood, or change my sensor, or put more insulin in this damn pump. The list of constant alerts goes on and on. Sometimes I think it just beeps at me to remind me, you have diabetes, you need me, you can't have a normal life. I can't escape it. It's a total buzzkill. Kind of like a vegetarian in a barbecue. <laughs> I'm not this. As my years of with diabetes have progressed, I've found it more and more difficult to accept. I can't stop myself from wondering, will I lose my eyesight one day? Will I lose my feet to this disease that doesn't allow me to heal and fight infection like a normal person? Will I die much earlier than I would if I didn't have this disease wearing and tearing me from the inside? We're all dying slowly, but I'm constantly reminded that I'm dying a little less slowly than others. Put simply, it, it makes me feel vulnerable, and it's hard to feel vulnerable for everyone. It's so hard that sometimes we prefer to look away from the vulnerability of others. 
Not because we're mean or insensitive, but because it can be a little overwhelming. I think that's one reason we tolerate cruelty, because it's often easier to look away. The other thing is, when I found out I had diabetes, I took it in stride. I wasn't upset or anything, really. I think that's because there was nothing I could do about it. It's not like getting a hotel room with a bad view. You can't call the front desk and ask for a different room, right? So I just accepted it. I think that's how a lot of people feel when they hear about something terrible like wildlife services. Hey, there's nothing I can do about it. I might as well accept it. The thing is, we can do something about it. Tonight, together, we can do something about it. We can work together to protect the vulnerable instead of looking away. Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote, the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. He said this because he recognized that in many ways, prisoners are among the most vulnerable people in society. We know who we truly are as moral individuals by the way we respond to weakness and power. It's easy to serve the powerful because they usually reward our service, at least to a certain extent. Serving the weakest in our society offers us tangible rewards. How do we respond to the vulnerable? Do we exploit or ignore those who cannot speak for themselves, whose voices go unheard? Or do we rush to give them aid and comfort? Do we speak for those who cannot speak for themselves? I don't know who said money is the root of all evil, but in this case, they're absolutely right. But it can be the root of some good if people like you are willing to help us fight back. Wild Earth Guardians has a plan for stopping the cruelty of wildlife services in Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I can share it with you. Here's what it is. Number one, we sue the shit out of them. Yeah. We challenge their every move in the courts. Number two, we recruit more guardians by telling the stories of the vulnerable, by being a voice for the voiceless. We will use social media, local media, national media, smoke signals, carrier pigeons, whatever we have to do to spread the word. Because the more people who know and understand that we're being compelled to pay for something that is both morally and scientifically wrong, the more people will join our cause. <laughs> Number three, we will fight for legislation that defunds wildlife services. We will work to cancel every wildlife services contract. We will shine the light wherever they hide, county by county and state by state until we put them out of the business. We won't stop until fences and shepherds, instead of gases and guns, are used to protect cattle and sheep on our public lands. We will not stop until we are all guardians. I'm tired of the endless slaughter, and I'm sick and tired of paying for it. But I'm not too tired to fight, and I hope that you'll join me. Thank you. Yeah.